Oops. Hey everyone, and welcome to week 10 of um, Open, Open Life Sciences fourth cohort. We're delighted to have you here today. I'm going to run through our usual um, housekeeping information and then we'll kick the call off. Um, so first of all, we have the reminder that we have a code of conduct. And as a general rule, this means treat one another with respect uh, and the way that you would like to be treated by other people. If at any point you feel like this hasn't been um, observed, either something you've experienced or something you've witnessed, you can report this. We have the team at openlifesci.org email address, which reaches myself, Berenice, Emmy, and Malvika. Um, or if you'd prefer to uh, report it to an individual rather than the team for some reason, then we also have our email addresses on line 66 right now, although that will move um, as people add to the etherpad. Um, on the top left of the screen, we have a live transcript uh, using otter.ai, which is the reason that when you joined the call, it said it was streaming. Uh, you can click on that to view what's being said at any given time, but this doesn't work in breakout rooms. Uh, so what we ask is that if you're going to be participating in breakout rooms, that you modify your Zoom name um, and add S in front of your name if you prefer a spoken breakout room or W in front of your name if you prefer to be in a breakout room that's written. Um, this just allows us to sort you effectively based on your preferred interaction type. Um, and to do that in Zoom, I go to the participant list, at least on my computer, and I find my name and beside my name, I click on more and then I can click on rename to add the W or add the S in front of my name. Um, I think I've covered all of the basic housekeeping bits. Uh, so we're talking about different ways to disseminate knowledge at the moment. Um, and from here, I'll hand over to Emmy to do the next bit. Thanks, Yo. So yeah, just a brief introduction of what this call is about. It's all about open science, as the title says, but more specifically about how you can share your knowledge. And we're very excited to have a couple of speakers today with us. We'll talk about various ways that they share their knowledge through their networks and communities. Um, yeah, without further ado, I hand over to Emma. Hello, that was short and sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to introduce our first speaker who's speaking about sharing knowledge through training and it's our lovely, one of our lovely co-leaders, uh, Bernice. Thanks for the introduction. Um, can you share my, can you see my screen? Okay, yes. great. Um, so just, yeah, thanks for the invitation and um, just to make a quick uh, so I prepare my slides this morning really quickly because we are yeah to risk a bit of something. So um, I'm not convinced about the quality of the talk today. Just to be sure, it's a big disclaimer uh, for today. Um, so and I have big issue with my audio. Uh, did you hear anything? Can you hear? Still hear me? You can hear me or cannot? Yeah, good. Um, I'm not sure if I can hear you, but for now I will continue and we will see later. Sorry for that. I don't know what happened there. Um, so Emma said, so I'm a co-lead uh, and organizer of OLS, but I'm also, yeah, Berenice Batu, and I'm part of everything there. So pictures are representing mostly me, my daughter, my where I live in Freiburg here, nice city there. Um, but today I will mostly talk about trainings and galaxies. So I don't know if any of you know what is Galaxy. So Galaxy is a, is a platform uh, for data analysis that gave access to many um, thousands of that data analysis tools. Mostly the focus was mostly bioinformatics at the beginning, but now it's moving for, towards any type of data analysis. So mostly giving access to uh, tools that are usually uh, command line tools and give an interface for these tools. So for example, these diamond tools that is mostly using command lines, you can have access to all the commands and you can run that directly within Galaxy and without needing to, to know about the command line. Um, so it's around, I don't remember, 8,000 8, of tools available within that can be accessible within Galaxy. What you need now afterwards is having a server and there is many Galaxy server available for that. Um, but why Galaxy is good for teaching or for training is uh, because uh, with Galaxy, you can really focus on the science and not on the technical details of the tools. You don't need to install anything. You use a server that is already available with all the tools that you need. So you watch what the student needs is only a browser. 
Uh, it access, as I said, thousands of different tools, visualization, and we can even combine that with programming environment like Jupyter or R Studio. So you can even learn about R or Python within Galaxy without needing to set up a Jupyter notebooks or uh, something else. We have a bunch of shared data libraries for sharing a data sets, so specifically data for trainings. Uh, and we have a bunch of interactive tools like genome browser visualizations with an etc. And the Galaxy Training Network is a group of people that are interested in combining in joint forces to, to develop uh, training uh, resources for, for using Galaxy for teaching or training. And in particular, we put a lot of effort over the last five years to develop a collection of training materials around Galaxy by the community and for the community. Both are really important for us. And so we have this training website that is, that is accessible on training.galaxyproject.org. And it's all the tutorials, all the training there are fully accessible, uh, at least open uh, and freely uh, open for anyone that wants to use that. And we also put a lot of effort on accessibility. It's why I use this word. Uh, uh, introducing first. I will try to show you why in a few minutes. Um, so in the GTN uh, yeah, catalog of tutorials, um, we have around 20 topics, which is a scientific topics, mostly currently still bioinformatics, but we have also climate, ecology, uh, we have chemoinformatics, uh, we have a lot of new topics that are uh, um, including, um, we have more than two 220 tutorials um, developed by more than 200 uh, contributors. Um, so it's a really large number of tutorials um, and they are really free to use to anyone and either suitable for self-study. Um, I'm sorry, I need to change something on my, on my audio setup because I cannot. Can you hear this bleeding noise? Okay, sorry. So we can I hear you okay. There's no background noise. Um, I'm really sorry for that. We can't hear you now. No, still can't hear you. Bernice, it was fine before when you were talking. You couldn't hear the, the background noise. You're also on mute now, though. Oh, yeah. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. OK, I'm really sorry. I have no idea what's going on, and I need to fix that soon also. OK, I will continue just if it's OK, and I will try to make sure. Yeah. So we have a big catalog of tutorials there. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. OK, good. Then <laughs> it's back to normal. Um, so that are either suitable for self-studying or for teaching. I will go that. Um, anyone can contribute to create new tutorials, update that, and it's really community-driven. Um, and as I said, all the tutorials that we have are really uh, both suitable for self-studying or for being using by instructor for teaching. So most of the tutorials follow a scientific story, so often recreating a published analysis. So we take uh, data from, from, from papers or for available on, in, um, in public database, and we go through the analysis state by state um, and explaining with where we combine both uh, end-zone section uh, where people really do the analysis, so they really do the, the, the different steps that they need to do, and also mixed with uh, a scientific and technical background to explain why we do these different steps and how we can uh, um, interpret the results that we can see. Uh, an important thing that we have also for all the tutorials is we try to provide, uh, so we have automatic uh, translation of all the tutorials in at least four languages, uh, using Google Translate, so the quality is not the best, but at least it's a given ID of that. And we have also now a big efforts for manual translation on some of the tutorial in Spanish, 
and there is effort uh, by the community. So every time there is a new change in the regional tutorials, the Spanish community needs to incorporate that new change in the Spanish translation. So we try to make sure that we have a community beyond this effort. And there is discussion to have that also in other languages than just Spanish, because we have this a uh, lot of people asking for this type of voice translation in different languages and good quality translation there. Um, so as I said, so the tutorials are also designed for teaching. So we have uh, tutorials include a bunch a bunch of metadata that are uh, recommend, required to, to be sure that this tutorial is in, is in good quality. Um, all the question addressed in the lessons, learning objectives, prerequisite knowledge, but also supporting materials like uh, uh, data sets, uh, workflows to support that, to, to, to reproduce the analysis that we can check quickly if the, if the tutorials is still in good shape and can be still be run. Um, we have a lot um, like difficulty uh, levels of introduction, the estimation of the time you need to do that, uh, take home messages, reference for further learning, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and all these annotations are also displayed in all the tutors uh, using bioschema annotations to be sure that um, we make sure that these uh, tutors can be easily findable and uh, by in different ways. So try to, to stick also to, the, to follow the fair principle for training materials. Um, we have also in the tutorials a bunch of informative assessments in the form of question boxes and with solutions to help people to want to follow if they, if they understood the question, but also estimate if they, they, are, they didn't do any mistake somewhere in the tutorials and that they could ask for help if needed during the training or during an event or, some, or evaluate themselves if they do it on their own. Um, one nice feature that we have also in Galaxy in that is we have the GTN in Galaxy, so you can really already check the tutorials. You don't need to open a new browser to to check your tutorials. You can do it directly within the Galaxy interface. So on the top here, you have a small hut, and it will open the GTN for the Galaxy training website, and you can find your tutorials that you want to follow. And then once you are ready, you want to do the analysis, you go to, tutor, to the tutorials and you do that. And we have even a direct link. I don't know if it's visible in there, but um, if you have a tools then here, you click really directly there and it will open directly the tools within Galaxy so that the people can really find directly the tools that they need to run, et cetera. So it's a direct link between Galaxy and the training on the back there. So it's really great for a small screen. So if you have only one screen um, and it's really a good way to jump back and forth between the tutorials and the galaxy to do the analysis. Um, we have nowadays, because uh, and mostly because we had to move a lot of the training events online, we, de we had a bunch of, we did a lot of recording of all, a lot of the tutorials. And um, so it's mean that we have a lot of, of videos available now and we now, um, they are available on different course page. For example, we had a big event that happened in February with thousands of people registered. And we had, I don't know, I remember our videos we had recorded for this event. So they are always, all of them available still on the, on the page and on the YouTube channel from the Galaxy community. And we are currently uh, also um, building that, that they are already available within the, the tutorial. So it's still not merged but it will be available in a few, probably next week, that we have already, the, the you can access the video directly from the tutorials. Um, and we have a lot of support, not only for, for people for learning, but also for people for uh, teaching. So support for instructors. So all the slides, we have slide decks that can come with the tutorials. Um, they have all speaker notes uh, to help people to prepare. And these speaker notes can be also used to generate automatically video. So we have a, a way to generate automatically once we have a slide with, um, with annotated with uh, speaker notes, we generate them automatic uh, videos for that with uh, an automatic voice. Um, we have also FAQ pages for all the tutorials, for most of the tutorials uh, to see common question and answer. And it's also a good way for people to teach, to prepare themselves for teachings. And we add additional question after each event that we have when we collect uh, 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 usual question that people ask. 
And it's really, a, as I said, a community effort. So over the last five years, we have more than 200 people that contributed to tutorials. Uh, either it can be one or two tutorials, but it can be also like really like every month creating, updating tutorials or creating new things. And it's the best way that we can keep all the materials up to date and creating new things, new topics to follow also what are the, the community um, needs for training there. Um, and the question is which Galaxy use because there is many servers available and for all the trainings, all the tutors we have, we don't need to set up your own training server to teach. You can check which of the Galaxy servers are already available and each tutorial is annotated with a list of public Galaxy servers that can be used for teaching these specific tutorials because it has all the tools needed for that uh, specific tutorial. We also uh, put a lot of efforts to be sure that you can use these servers with developing the training infrastructure as a service, which is dedicated resources for workshops. So when you, you ask for these specific resources, then you have in the Galaxy server a dedicated queue with dedicated resources uh, for, your, for your participant and the people go there. They, have, uh, they don't have to wait uh, that the other normal, I would say normal users uh, are using all the resources you have dedicated resources for that and for for the teachers we have we provide a dashboard to monitor the student progress so we don't know which student is uh, for example is stuck and the the jobs are not running but you know that if all the there is uh, if it's green like this so it means uh, all the jobs are done so it's a way for you to pace to to know okay i need to move forward or i need to wait a bit more thank you um, for workshop organizer, we have we start created a, a bunch of tutorials with checklists to help you to organize uh, tips and tricks, uh, how to set up, uh, how to request a TIAS. And we have uh, now uh, a really nice feature that has been implemented uh, last week uh, during the uh, Elixir Biohackathon, so European Biohackathon, where the idea is to build your own courses. So you can select which tutorials you want to do, when, which what you want to, to, to set up. You can reorganize the sentence. Uh, you can, and you have a, somehow a schedule based on that. So just based on the, on the metadata that we provided with the tutorials, it's why we need really good metadata. We can give you an idea of uh, when, what could be your courses that you could run. So it's a good way to help uh, uh, organizers to, to, to set up their own uh, workshop there. It's still really preliminary. I mean, as I said, it's, it started only last week. Sorry again. I don't really know what's going on here. Okay. I think it's good. Okay, for well, now it's back. Um, um, yeah, so we also put a lot of efforts to be sure that people can contribute. So we created tutorials to help people to contribute, to create new tutorials. We have also a lot of efforts to make sure that it's easy for anyone to contribute. So we created a, what we call the training development kit with a web server that helps people to create the structure of the skeleton of the tutorials from a workflow uh, on Galaxy. Um, yeah, we have a lot of more things like this. We, we also try to put sure that we gave credit to everybody that worked and put efforts on training and developing or maintaining training materials. So we, we have a dedicated page for any of the contributors. We have a, what we call the Ale of Fame. So we, where you can see all the contributors and link to, the, to their contribution. So here, Anna, you see, uh, worked on these tutorials and this slide deck. And we can also, see, you can, we, we give access also to different metrics for each of the tutorials for you to know that how your tutorial has been used. So you can see how many people have visited, visited your tutorial for a specific time, period of time. And we have also at the end of all the tutorials, a feedback form that people can, can fill. And we ask, uh, then we aggregate all this uh, information uh, in a page that you can see really for your tutorials, how people liked it or didn't like it somehow. And um, so it's a good way to give to give feedback to the contributors. Um, and we try to support and really uh, engage with uh, all the instructors. So we have a open, uh, we have a Gitter channel that is also a matrix channel. I don't know for people that, uh, so there is this matrix element uh, thing. So we have a Gitter channel. Um, you can find all the events on the page here. I just try to 
be a bit quick. Um, is it still the noise also? Can you hear that? Okay, good. Then I continue and I will try to, uh, yeah, it's a really strange noise. And we try to organize a GTN collaboration fest every three months on the third Thursday. So the next will be tomorrow, where we have community calls uh, for three time zones where you can people can ask their questions, learn how to develop tutorials, discuss with other instructors, and we provide support the whole day uh, for people there. And so Galaxy training is used in different uh, setup applications uh, from trainings, uh, remote, hybrid, but also face-to-face -face. in high schools, in university. We know that it's used also, we use it all for citizen science projects also, just to give you an idea how it's used. Um, and we organized, I wanted to quickly mention that a big events last year where we had more than 1,200 registrations from 78 country. And we will uh, reproduce the same event in March next year. So similar events that we have a lot of recorded, probably even more videos, more uh, trainings, et cetera. So there will be a lot of new things. Uh, we have new, a lot of plans for developing uh, train the trainer even uh, trainings also for, for people to, to become more familiar how to teach, how to, to, to do that. So really supporting the community. I mentioned quickly, so we put a lot of also our efforts on uh, supporting, be sure that our materials is fair, our data is are fair also, so is, everything is fair somehow. We are working with the Elixir Fair training groups um, and that's, yeah, that. And I think that's all, and I just, there is this nice talk you can look at in, in YouTube uh, that introduce you to the GTN. And I, I will stop sharing, I will stop sharing my screen and try to fix this audio. Sorry. Ah, here, yeah, it's back. Okay. Thank Thanks. you, Benny. Sorry. That, that was, that was amazing. Strange. And I cannot <laughs> hear you, so it's really great. Oh. Um. Can you hear me now? No, <laughs> you can't hear me. And I need to, to drop to go to another meeting. I'm really sorry, I, I cannot. I, I joined in, in 40 minutes back, so I need to be to jump into text. See you later. <laughs> so I'm sure Bernice, uh, I found that really interesting because I didn't really know very much about Galaxy and that's an amazing resource that she has been involved in creating there. And yo, I saw your picture there too. <laughs> so, um, so thanks very much um, to Bernice. I, I can see that there's a couple of questions in there. Um, from Alejandro and Arant. So I don't know if, if anyone else can answer those. I'm sure they're maybe just for Benny. So I'm sure she'll write some answers there um, at some point. Um, so we'll just uh, move on. Um, so now we're going into um, a, um, also if you have any other questions, please do put them also in, in our shared document as well. Um, so we're going to just move on now to um, doing a quiet reflection exercise um, about planning and preparing um, what outcomes of your project should be shared with the wider community? Um, so I assume, you know, are we going to we're going to go to breakout rooms, or we're we just going to do this one's just a, a quiet, quiet everyone team. sit and think for a couple of minutes and write. Oh right, okay. So I mean, the questions we've got there it starts online, um, one hundred and fifteen, um, and the things we should be writing about are what sorts of things within your project can be shared and why. Um, and and you can also write about what you don't think should be shared and why. So we've got um, probably a bit less than 10 minutes now, probably to keep on time. Is that right? Yeah.
Is it just me or can no one write in the in the document? It kicked me out briefly and then I had to refresh it. I don't know if anyone else is having the same problem. Yeah, mine just froze. It's working fine for me, uh, actually. Yeah. Thanks. Just us then. <laughs> Oh, now it's fine. Yeah, so refreshing works. If anyone has the same problem. I can see that problem keep happening, you know. It keeps saying for me the rate limit. Is it we're typing too quickly or is it we're typing too much? <laughs> I'm wondering the same if it's just like there are literally 20 people hammering away at a keyboard at one poor little ether pad and it's just like, no. <laughs> um, the answers Stop. coming in are incredible though. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got um uh, yeah, you've shared um, to share as much training material as possible. Yeah, I definitely second that just to put everything that you do in training online now. I think it's it's very common practice and really benefits people. Um, we've also got uh, Alyssa has said, um, I can definitely share anonymous survey results and documentation. Yeah, um, but we do you do have to think quite carefully with surveys and make sure that you do keep it anonymous if you're saying you are. Um, I've had in the past where actually someone has done a survey and it does collect information because they haven't clicked the right button or something like that. So there can be troubles with surveys, I found. Um, but all saying every material for its own DOI, Alejandro, everything. Um, and then we've got, yeah, Adele saying everything except private data. And I've kind of written something similar about sensitive data. We have to really consider that. And I work on a health project. So uh, a lot of data, well, most all of the data is not shareable, but you can still make your code and your metadata available and also write very clear procedures about how the data could be accessed and be used by other researchers. And that's a really important thing to do. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's lots of really great things. I won't read them all out because it's, um, but yeah, sharing raw data can sometimes be a problem, but it's a great thing. Maybe we have to move on, yeah, do we? Um, I think perhaps, yeah. I think we, we've, we've had a good chance to cover these, um, but it's probably a good idea to move on to the next bit. Oh, which is me. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the etherpad. All right, who's taking the next section? Ah, right. Okay. Um, so I just want to echo um, everything Emma's been saying about all the different nuances that we've been thinking about how to effectively share is really cool. And I'm really enjoying the reading and just hoping that um, the etherpad being mean hasn't stopped you from sharing too many of your awesome ideas. 
Um, I have yet to find any collaborative document editor that actually allows everyone to edit right all the time. Um, it is a bit of a challenge, so sorry about that. Um, but next we have uh, a speaker who is um, going to talk a little bit about uh, basically preprints, DOI and citation. Um, so I'm delighted we have with us uh, Marcel Leflamme. Did, did I say that right? <laughs> Yeah, sounds great. <laughs> awesome. Um, and uh, Marcel works at PLOS. I'm sure that you actually will introduce yourself far better than I do. So over to you for the next bit. And thank you so much. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Yo, for the, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to, to be here with you today. Thanks very much for the, for the invitation. Um, let me share my slides here. Um, and yeah, they, they should also be linked in the pad there if you want to pull them up on your end. Let's see, so is that visible to everyone? Awesome, that's great. Um, and I will just set a timer on my end to kind of keep myself honest as well. Um, great. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk a bit about preprints today, and I, I should say going in that my, um, I, I'm, I'm not making many assumptions about people's um, existing knowledge about preprints, so, so this presentation is really, you know, the, the getting started part, I guess, is, is um, yeah, uh, this, this is really intended to be an introduction for folks who maybe um, haven't used preprints before, um, uh, yeah, or are, are new to this area of open science. Um, but of course, in q and if, if you're a veteran preprint user, um, I, I would love to hear more about particular use cases or, or challenges that you've had. Um, so yeah, my, my name is Marcel Laflamme. Um, I am an open research manager at PLOS. Um, my academic training is in um, the field of cultural anthropology. Um, and I did a, a postdoc um, at a, a research center in, in Vienna, um, thinking about open science from kind of an innovation studies perspective. So that's my, my background. Um, so yeah, to, to get us started, if we just ask what is a preprint, um, here at PLOS we talk about that as um, a version of a scientific manuscript posted on a public server prior to formal peer review. And I want to qualify that in, a, in a, a few ways or kind of unpack that definition a little bit. Um, so when we say posted on a public server, so, so we mean that this is um, free and it's out on the open web um, for, for anyone to read, right? So, so this is different from pre-circulating a manuscript among colleagues or in a, in a more kind of closed context, right? So, so part of what makes preprints open is the sense that the work is available sort of on the open web. That's a, an important part to, to flag. Um, and then when we say prior to formal peer review, I, you know, the, the normative case that we have in mind is that um, a preprint is posted and then at, at some point following that, the author goes on to, to submit the manuscript to review at a journal or, or another publication. Um, but it's important to say that's not always the case, right? And, and I, I think the way that we use the word preprint has sort of expanded over time um, to include work that, that may not subsequently go through formal peer review, that really is more of a white paper, more of a, you know, a, a, a scientific output that, um, yeah, that, that, that for other reasons may not go through the, the formal peer review process. Um, I think the definition is sort of evolving in that way. Um, so, you know, again, I mean, once, once a preprint is posted on a public server, um, and, and those could include um, community-based preprint servers, those could include um, commercial services um, that we could think about academia.edu or, or ResearchGate, those could be in institutional repositories um, at, at the institution where you're based. So th there's a lot of places that preprints can live. Um, and you know, once they are posted there, your preprint does become a permanent part of the scientific record. So that's important to understand that once a preprint um, has been posted, the idea is that, that you know, most preprint servers will not then take it down, right? So it, it, it is a decision to sort of um, share something and, and to make it shareable 
going forward. Um, often there's an open license that's applied um, that that defines the terms under which it, it can be can be reused. Um, but yeah, importantly, this makes your work citable, right? And and we see um, you know examples of this in uh, in in published articles, in grant proposals, in in funding applications. Um, you know, formal citations of preprints are, are becoming increasingly common, right, across the research landscape. Um, and, you know, one bit of, of kind of scholarly infrastructure or, or you know, scholarly plumbing um, that makes that possible is, is the assignment of a digital object identifier or DOI, right, so that um, even if the server where you've placed your, your preprint moves or or um yeah otherwise uh you know is 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 shut down and that material is sort of archived somewhere else that digital object identifier that would be included in a citation will make sure that that anyone who has cited or has encountered your preprint can find um the, the most recent version and so you know i think we really emphasize that that you know the the advantage of preprint uh, of preprinting has a lot to do with accelerating the speed at which science moves forward. Um, and and I'll, I'll say more about that in this next section. Um, but just to give you a sense of, of kind of the growth of preprints across fields, this is just the last five years. Um, you know, certainly in 20 and 21, you're, you're seeing in part um, a, a spike that's, that's related to research on and, and during the pandemic. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say that, that um, you know, even 10 years ago, um, you could really talk about preprint cultures. You could really talk about different fields that were more or less engaged with preprints. Um, and, you know, we could even take that back to the pre-digital era, right? And the circulation of manuscripts in print form um, through things like information exchanges. Um, but at PLOS, certainly one thing we've seen is that, there, you know, there is strong growth in the use of preprints across fields certainly in the life sciences, um, in the health sciences and, and beyond. Um, and yeah, I, I think that that, that, um, that growth is encouraging and, and, and allows fields that are maybe newer to preprinting to sort of learn from some of the lessons and the best practices of fields that have been doing it for, for a long time. Um, but I should also say, and, and you know, we have sort of a, a little, um, Example here from from Med Archive from a preprint server. Um, you know, I think the the wider use of preprinting involves new negotiations around trust and credibility of preprints, and I think it's really important to understand those in relation to particular audiences, right? So if we look at the the kind of disclaimer here, right? So Med Archive is saying, um, you know, clinicians shouldn't necessarily grab a preprint and use it to inform their clinical practice, working with patients, you know, the day that they have the preprint in hand, um, that they're asking news media not to report on preprints as established information. Um, so, you know, I think during the pandemic, there was, you know, some, some concern, some justified and maybe some a bit um, reactionary or, or overblown, um, but, but yeah, I mean, concern that preprints could somehow um, damage the credibility of the of the scholarly communication system, and you know I, I think um, publishers and researchers are really thinking about how to help readers, is, you know, assess the the, the credibility of a of a preprint. There there are you know different techniques for doing that, and I think for you as researchers as well, you can think about that, right? So if you encounter a preprint from a researcher who's in your narrow subfield, right? To what extent are you in a position to assess its credibility? How might that be different if you're looking at a preprint in an adjacent field, right? Or as it moves away from your core area of expertise? So I would say this is really like a live question right now in the in the realm of open science. Um, it is thinking about these questions around around credibility. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll kind of just clip through this part quickly around sort of benefits uh, of, of using preprints. Um, we talked a bit about, you know, rapid dissemination, I think is, is, is one of the key ones. Um, but I'll, I'll say a bit about the second one here, establishing priority. Um, so, you know, I, I think by, um, by, by, by reporting findings in the form of a preprint um, and, and getting those timestamps, getting those sort of um, admitted into the scientific record, 
Um, you know, sometimes researchers, I think, have concerns about, well, I'm, I'm going to share it and it'll get scooped, right, that, that others will sort of take my work and they'll run with it. Um, but, but at PLOS, one thing we've seen is actually that, that researchers can use preprints as a way to say, you know, these findings, yeah, I, we, we, we did reach these findings at this particular moment. Um, and that's not to say that others can't, can't build on it, but it's really a way of documenting um, the, you know, the, 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 the priority of, of that finding in certain cases. Um, yeah, but we can talk about sort of increased attention, um, you know, there's research on sort of increased citations once a paper is formally published, um, when a preprint exists, um, likewise around sort of career advancement, right? So being able to, in your, your job materials, um, to be able to share work and not just list it as in progress, right? But really sort of be able to show that progress to, um, to a hiring committee, to a, a funding agency. Um, the last two I think are, are um, yeah, well, so when we talk about community, we can talk about sort of ways of getting feedback on, uh, on work that is still in progress. Um, and, and various forms that that can take sort of on a platform through different kinds of commenting or annotation. Um, but we've also seen things like um, preprint clubs kind of on the model of a journal club um, where, where researchers are sort of seeking out preprints, engaging with them and trying to provide authors with feedback on them. So different mechanisms of that that we've seen kind of cropping up. Um, and then this last piece around sort of timely updates I think is really important that um, versioning is really a basic feature of preprints. It's one thing that makes a preprint a preprint and makes it in some ways different than a published article, right? So with published articles, we often still have this term, the version of record. Um, you know, that term itself is, I think, changing and, and um, you know, thinking about revisions or, or, or new ways of updating the scientific record, even when something has been published. But for preprints, that's baked in. Right, the understanding is that a preprint can always be updated, um, and, and you know there's there's the expectation that a preprint will be updated over time, um, and I, I think that's another advantage that it allows us to sort of um, show our work evolving in real time and in a way that others can engage with, rather than sort of pretending that that a yeah a fixed version is is going to be true for all time. Um, I think I'm. Despite my timer, I'm short on time, so I'll just clip quickly through this last section here. Um, you know, it, in in thinking about how publishers like PLOS support preprints, and you know, I, I think it's I think it's fair to say that that publishers um, run the gamut from being really supportive of and encouraging of preprints to um, you know a more cautious view. Um, you know, historically there have been publishers that have really seen preprints as competition, right? In saying you know. Publishers would like to be the sort of passage point for scientific information. And so, you know, preprints represent a kind of um, a threat or a sort of end run around the sort of role that the publishers play. Um, you know, likewise, journals, I think this is less and less true today, but at one point, um, there were journals with policies that would say, you know, if something's been published as a preprint, perhaps it wouldn't be considered for publication, that that would be considered a, a prior publication. I'd say today that's very rare. So I mean, to, you know, I think even five years ago that might have been a more common state of affairs. Today it's rare, although of course it's always worth checking with the journal um, that that you may have in mind. So I'll just say a few things about what PLOS does to sort of support preprints, um, and, and you know, maybe in order of kind of established ways of working to more experimental um, things that that we're trying. Um, one is, is sort of transfers from preprint servers. And so if you as a researcher upload a preprint to a, a server like BioArchive, you'll have the option to transfer that manuscript directly to a journal of your choosing, right? And um, a number of PLOS journals are, are on that list for BioArchive in particular. Um, I mean, there, there's, I think, you know, well over a hundred titles that, that, that participate in that. Um, and so, you know, that's partially about just the convenience of the researcher sort of, you know, um, integrating that, that submission process and, and sort of, you know, from the publisher's point of view, of course, it's great, right? It's a, it's a new, it's an additional source of, of submissions. Transfers to preprint servers is something that the PLOS also does. And I think this is something that, you know, you might see in more kind of open science oriented or mission oriented publishers. 
um, who say, you know, when you submit a research article to PLOS um, for, for certain titles and, and certain article types, um, you'll be asked, would you like us, if you haven't posted it as a preprint already, would you like us to post it to BioArchive for you? Right, so we have a relationship with BioArchive, um, a complementary one with MedArchive that, that we'll, be, we'll be rolling out in, in the months ahead um, to, um, yeah, to, to facilitate the posting of that preprint. Um, because at PLOS, we believe that that's valuable and that, that, that driving adoption of preprints in diverse research communities is really a priority for us. Um, I'll just say a little bit about our, our kind of scooping policy. Um, and this is something that you know you'll you'll see at some other publishers. So that you know if a if a um, an article has been published, um, or particularly if a preprint has been published, um, rather than um, than disqualifying it for consideration because it's sort of not a novel finding, um, by registering that finding as a preprint um, at, at PLOS journals, you're specifically given this period where, where we would consider that work complementary research. We would invite that submission, um, even if the finding resembles one that, that has been reported elsewhere. Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to give authors incentive to, to share their work and not to worry that, that by doing so, they're sort of um, putting themselves at a, at a disadvantage. Last slide here, um, just, yeah, I think at PLOS we're also interested in, in being responsive to kind of bottom up community initiatives that are going on. Um, I, I won't kind of give you the details of this one called Review Commons, but, but it's one that we've participated in. Um, and, and it goes back to this point about kind of trust and credibility. So, so Review Commons is working with the idea of refereed preprints, right? Of, of authors um, submitting a manuscript and actually getting a rapid review on the preprint itself, which they have the option of sharing. And so even before that manuscript is considered by journals um, and Review Commons can, can transfer those submissions on to various partner journals, including some at PLOS, um, but the idea is that the refereed preprint that would live on a server like BioArchive, readers can encounter that and have a better sense of the, the credibility of that of that preprint than they might otherwise. Um, so PLOS participated in a, a pilot of Review Commons over the last two years. Um, and yeah, we, we see it as one of a number of kind of exciting initiatives um, around, yeah, kind of at the boundaries of preprints and more formally published articles. Um, we see that boundary sort of changing and shifting in really interesting ways. So thanks so much, happy to answer any questions that, that you might have. And, and again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much, Marcel. Can we just have a round of applause? Uh, amazing. Cool, thank you. Um, so one thing I was really enjoying during this talk was questions were popping up and then Marcel, you would answer them before we even had the chance to ask them. <laughs> I think two of the three questions actually got answered that way mid talk. Um, there was one about they, they trust um, around, around COVID related preprints. Um, and another about the the um, fears of negative chances of publishing in certain journals. Um, but there was one that I don't think was answered, so I'll ask that one, um, which was from Arendt. Um, after the work in a preprint is peer reviewed and published, should it remain available as a preprint? I've seen research articles behind paywalls where the preprint is still available. Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think that one way of talking about preprints um, and that in an open science context that we tend to use is around rapid dissemination, around, yeah, that, that sort of has in mind the window of time before a paper is formally published, right? And so we know that review can take time. Sometimes, um, you know, a, a paper can, can get shopped around to a few different journals before it finds a home. And so, you know, there's a way in which we have these findings that, that really may speak to, to, to timely topics, both kind of in our fields and, and um, you know, in society at large. Um, and so, you know, the, the sometimes slow pace of peer review at a particular journal or kind of across the science system. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of one argument for preprints, right? That says that, that it gets that, those findings out sooner. Another way of talking about preprints is about access and is about paywalls, right? And, and um, 
before I came to PLOS, I was the managing editor for an open access journal. And so, you know, I, I think another way of talking about preprints is as a route of what's often called green OA, right? So, so that even when a research article does appear in a paywall journal, having a, a preprint available can be a way of providing access to a manuscript um, for readers who, who don't have access to the paywall article. Um, and the advantage of that, of course, is sort of from the point of publication and later, right? So, I mean, in a sense, the, you know, the enduring benefit of the, of the preprint doesn't go away when the article is published, um, but, but, you know, in some ways, it also allows sort of ongoing access um, for, for readers who, who may not have it otherwise. Um, now, I mean, there are folks who say that, that uh, you know, once the version of record appears, is there a need for the preprint anymore? It's been sort of made obsolete by the, the version of record. Um, but yeah, I, I think our, our position at PLOS is that there, there is value in kind of capturing those outputs, also in just seeing how a work evolves over time, um, how, you know, how it evolves in conversation with reviewers, how it can be improved by the, the production process that a publisher can, can, can put an article through. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that, um, that the value of the preprint, maybe it's, it's helpful to think about in those two timescales, so before publication and after publication. And, and um, yeah, my, my position is that there's definitely value to both. Super. OK, thanks so much. Uh, that's been a really, really interesting um, and quite informative talk. Uh, so I think we're going to move on to the next bit of breakouts. So Emmy, over to you. Thank you, Jo, and thank you so much, Marcel. It's really interesting. Um, yeah, moving onwards to our breakout session of today, uh, as we learned uh, in our little reflection exercise, um, there are many ways to share science, but uh, it isn't always straightforward. So um, in this breakout session, uh, as we would in every other breakout session, we'll split you into groups. Um, and uh, so we'll be in groups of three or four uh, with this fantastic Zoom breakout uh, room arrangement. Um, you'll have eight minutes. Please um, assign a note taker in your group if you're in a spoken room. And I guess and if you're in a written room, everyone can just type on the etherpad. Hopefully we won't break it again. <laughs> um, and um, there are uh, sections on the etherpad. So, uh, Let's say, let's take room one as an example under line 165. There are two prompts there. So we're asking you to pick one of them as group and um, just reflect on it and uh, share some of your thoughts around that. So oh, I'm just reading the chat. Thank you, Marcel, um, for joining us. Um, but yes, uh, just please make sure that you uh, share your notes um, under each of the questions that you discuss so that other people can, who don't have the chance to reflect on, well, they'll be refle reflecting on other prompts, um, can also read your notes on what you thought about yours. So I think that's all of the breakout room. Is that sort of understandable? All right. Um, bye, Aaron. <laughs> uh, yo, if we are ready, we are. I think that the levers haven't made the rooms too uneven. Um, if you're a speaker or a host, you don't have to join breakout rooms, but you're welcome to. And they are opening now. Oh, and that's gone in too. Nope, stop the recording. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm looking at Nadine because you're, you're unmuted and I wonder if that was from before or <laughs> you want to say something. Okay. That was from no before, worries. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, yeah, no, no problem. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, lots of lovely comments. Um, I see that some groups discuss, uh, in group, group two, for example, um, discussed about, I see uh, notes on, on credit, uh, on um, Elisa, Elisa and Saranjit and Lena, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, how to give people uh, appropriate credit or how to get appropriate credit for um, helping other people out. Um, and uh, what's, yes, yeah, whether, you know, it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, there are ways that we, we've also, Marcel also discussed briefly the OI citation and other ways that you could, you could potentially give other people credit um, that goes beyond sort of commercial, commercial uh, gains, I suppose. Um, and, and those are rapidly revolve, evolving as well. Um, and um, yeah, reading through about uh, various uh, considerations as well around personal data. Again, that's a topic that you know we've we've uh, we've talked about briefly before, but um, yeah, it's definitely very important. Um, so it's good to always think about it and seek professional help, <laughs> I suppose, if you have uh, uh, concerns or questions. Um, and uh, of course, all uh, is always a space that I've seen these questions get answered and get discussed, and so. So yeah, that, that would be my place of choice, you know, if you're thinking about anonymizing data, um, protecting personal data. Yeah, sorry, I, yeah, I, um, there's, I'm sure there's a lot more thoughts behind these. So if you if you have a little time to sort of uh, think about what you've discussed within your groups and share them out, um, then uh, we'd really appreciate reading your discussions and learning from them as well. Um, in the meantime, because looking at the clock, um, I'd like to, move on to you uh, talk about publishing and citing open research code. Um, very lucky and very grateful to have Nicoletta with us today and I'm sure she'll introduce herself much better. Over to you. Hello everyone. Uh, nice. Uh, there we go. Fantastic. So I'm assuming you can see my slides. If not, if something is broken, then please let me know. Can you also see yourselves on my slide? Yes, okay, so I'm going to minimize this. Perfect. Um, yes, so hello everyone, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here and I'm super excited about the author AI. Uh, I think that's a fantastic idea and we're definitely looking into maybe bringing it here for our um, online meetings. Nevertheless, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, publishing and citing open research code, uh, but I would like to start off by introducing myself uh, first. Um, I changed my slide, so if you didn't see a change, please unmute yourself and let me know. Um, I am, uh, I'm currently working as a postdoc in the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Biology here in, in Germany. Uh, by training, I am an applied mathematician, and the models that I use are models to try and describe how certain behaviors are adopted by humans, bacteria, um, how they interact with each other, each other and how they change over time. So pretty much this is what the, the second plot in the right is about. If we have a population of different behaviors over time, is there one specific behavior that takes over? Um, this, uh, log this is also the logo of an open source project called the Axelrod Python library um, that I am involved in. It's a Python package because uh, I mainly program in Python. Um, and I use these packets uh, throughout my PhD. Uh, and actually the research that I did in my PhD would have been impossible uh, without research, research code. Uh, and even the work that I do now would also be impossible if I didn't uh, have research code. Um, because of this and how heavily my research relies on software, I became um, a fellow of the Software Sustainability Institute, which is based in the UK. Uh, and is an institute that tried to promote uh, software and well-written software in academia. I will talk a little bit about the SSI later. Um, and this year, I also became an editor of uh, JOS, the Journal of Open Source uh, Software, uh, a topic editor. And I will very briefly again talk about JOS uh, later. Um, so like I said, um, my research heavily relies on code. 
Um, and the way that I see research and uh, research code is like these two old friends that every time they meet with each other, they can only improve one another. My, my research gets better because of my code and my code gets better because of my research. Uh, so they both do go hand in hand. Um, I'm not the only person uh, that this applies to. Uh, actually, there was a survey done back in 2014. Um, it would be nice actually to see what the numbers look like today. Um, and the results were that seven out of 10 of the UK researchers said that it would be impossible for them to conduct research without software. So when I talk about research, I do include my software with it, right? Like software is part of uh, my research, it is part of my results. So when I hear the question, oh, why do we publish our research code? I actually want to tweak it a little bit and say, oh, why do we publish our research output, right? Because these two entities are the same. Uh, so why do we publish research output and why do we publish uh, our research code? Well, the first advantage is that it can really increase the visibility of our work. And number two is easily to quantify the recognition to credit. So unfortunately in the academic game, um, credits that matter, that do matter, we do uh, get assessed based on, on things such as citation counts. So when we put a lot of work to write this code uh, in order to produce results and to put, produce accurate results, then actually we should get the credits uh, for doing so. Uh, and finally, we, when, you, when you publish something, there's a pre-review process and pre-review process in general should lead to a better quality output. Someone in the audience could argue that's not always the case, um, but in most cases, uh, they do pro uh, review process do improve the quality. Um, and when I know it's scary to, to show your code and share your code with other people, uh, but when you actually have to pull review it, it can only get better. Uh, even me that I consider myself to be a, a, an expert, whatever that means, uh, if someone reviews my code, I will learn something. Um, and that's, it's, a, it's a great thing that we do not always take into account. But how do we go about um, publishing your code? Uh, well, this is not um, something that is very, you know, it, it's standard, not everyone knows, and that is okay, because I think the states that we are now, and please correct me if I'm wrong, we are here because of the community. So it wasn't the big journals that were pushing for this, it was the community that worked really hard to make sure that there are ways of publishing the code. Um, so this uh, amazing table, um, I did not write this amazing table. Uh, this is the table written by Lucy Whaley. Wally, I'm so bad at pronouncing last name. Um, she is also a fellow of the Sustainable Software Institute, and she's also a topic editor in JOS, the Journal of Open, uh, of Open Source Science as Software. And she gave the talk in September. And here's the link. I'm also going to have the link at the end. And, and she, she created this, uh, this table. And what this table is, is a summary of different publishing methods. Uh, the first one is through a public repo and a citation file. So if you have your code and your code is ready to be shared with people, the first thing that you need to do is make it available online. And you can use uh, things such as GitHub, or GitLab, or Bitbucket. And then you can also include a citation file. And the, the citation file, it could be in the BTEF format, or it can be just a standard way of how would you like people to, to cite your software. Um, the good thing about the, the, uh, doing this is you do get a citation and it's super time efficient because all you have to do is create a file. Um, unfortunately, by doing this, your software itself is not getting peer reviewed where you just create a file and this also does not count as a journal publication. Uh, the second method uh, that you can do is by a community peer review. So there are these communities, for example, our open sci and PI open sci. Um, where you submit your code and then the people will review it there. People will actually look at your code and you do get a citation. Um, it is time efficient, but it's not a journal publication in the end of the day. Um, I do say it's time efficient, but um, that is not because of personal knowledge here on Trusting Lucy, because I've actually never uh, interacted with either of the communities. Uh, but I, I do hear many great things about the R open sign. So, Please do check them out if uh, this is something that could be of interest to you. Um, the third method is by publishing a software paper. Okay, And here you're going to see two different rows, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference now. Uh, so by software paper, we mean that we, we write a, a beautiful long paper that describes our codes, it describes what it does, or maybe why we wrote things in the specific way we did it, and then we submit it to a journal. 
Now, people will read your paper, but it does not necessarily mean that people are going to read your code. Uh, so, for example, we publish a paper on the actual Python projects uh, that I spoke about earlier, but I know for sure that nobody looked at our code. They did look at the paper. We did get a citation because you get a citation. We did get a general publication, uh, but it was the software was not peer reviewed. Uh, was the time efficient? Uh, well, like the previous speaker said, uh, sometimes uh, general publications can take uh, quite some time. So it was also not very uh, time efficient because we had to go back and forth several times uh, through the course of another year. Um, the last method that I would like to talk about is the software meta paper. Okay, and where the differentiation is now is, for example, some journals such as the Journal um, of Open Source Software or the Journal of Open Source Educational Software, just in today. Um, what you need to do to publish with them is you write a very small short paper. They say that the paper should take one to two hours to write it. It took me longer, that's okay. Um, but it's to be a very short paper and people are gonna read the paper, but people are mainly gonna focus on looking at your code base. Um, and then you're gonna have back and forward with reviewers. Everything is gonna be online. The reviewers can help you improve your code base. And in the end of the day, you get a citation, your code is checked, and you also get a general publication. Uh, is it time efficient? On average, uh, it takes three months to publish a paper with JOS, but of course, sometimes there are outliers. Um, but these are the different uh, the different methods uh, I would just like to summarize today. Uh, I am an editor of JOS, right? So there is some self promotion here. Um, but also at the end, I will have a list uh, a link that points to an article written by the Software Sustainability Institute, and there they list several journals that you can actually publish your code with. And you can also, if you think that there's one journal that should be there and is not, you can also reach out to them and they include it here. And the link is going to be at the end. Uh, so just it's not uh, the only journal. That's what I would like to stress. Um, the last thing I would like to very briefly talk about is about uh, citing open research code. So should we cite projects that we use? Well, the short answer is yes. Um, like my wise advice, wise. Um, PhD supervisor said it's better to cite too much as, a, as opposed to little. And this is a, a great comment from one of the reviewers that I had in one of the submissions I was editing. And Christina said, I would tend to cite at least any dependencies to provide citation that provide citation guidance. So if you use some code written by other people, you should at least cite the people that do have a citation file uh, in their projects. Um, they don't need to be research projects to cite them, another great point. One of the goals of JOS, but actually one of the goals of anything, uh, is to help software get recognized for the role it plays in research. So I suggest being liberal in what you cite. It doesn't hurt you and you can help them. Um, I couldn't agree with Christina you know, more. Uh, I do try to follow pretty much exactly what she said uh, now in the way that I can, like, in how I cite things. Um, so please do cite any project that you use. And I get that sometimes you might say, you know, these projects do not have a citation file, they do not have a paper. Um, well, if you're using the project, it means that it has been made available somehow. So there's no harm in reaching out to these people and asking them to include, for example, a citation file. And this is exactly what I did for one of my projects, for one of the projects I was using uh, for my PhD. I was trying to, to calculate a measure and I couldn't, you know, it would have taken me months to implement the algorithm, but there was this project that was doing it and it was being tested and everything was great. Um, but the person did not have a, a citation file. So I just reached out to them and I said, would you like me to add a citation file? And he said, oh, do not feel like you need to cite our project. But I was like, no, you know, you, you do need to get the credits. And I just opened a pull request. Uh, and again, there is this blog post, which I'll point to uh, at the end. So should you cite projects? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the end of my presentation. Uh, here are some useful links. So this is uh, Lucy's talk, uh, a link to the Software Sustainability Institute and two of the uh, of the blog posts that I, I, I briefly talked about. Uh, but again, my slides are made available online, so you can find all this information there as well. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Nicoletta. That was like literally the clearest talk I've ever heard about <laughs> the ways to, to share research code and, com and the comparisons, beautiful uh, and so, so useful. So thank you so much for that. Um, folks, if you have any questions for Nicoletta uh, regarding anything um, she's mentioned about publishing and citing software, please 
uh, put them in the ether pad if they were below line 263 uh, or in the Zoom chat. Um, yeah, sorry, you want to say something? No, I just saw the comic that you shared, and um, I see you should have sent it to me this morning. I, I, I could have included it in my slides. It's a, it's a great comic. It's a great comic. Uh, I agree. I completely forgot about it. <laughs> uh, yes. Great. Uh, yeah, super. Uh, let's all check out the, the comic for sure. Um, Nadine has a, a question that looks very interesting. So if I could read it out on your behalf, Nadine. Uh, at the beginning, you said that the good code makes research better and vice versa. Um, while she sees uh, how good code improves research, for example, by reducing risk of making errors. Can't really think of example where good research improves code. Nicoletta? Um, I see what you mean, and then maybe by improve, what you mean is, you know, how it can make it faster or more clean and things like that. So this is one point, but then one point I would say is uh, new research and novel research, new algorithms and things like that, right? So then I can write a code for it and that itself, it's, it's new code. So, you know, the code base and the code packages themselves have improved. Um, I would say there is some science that goes behind, you know, making code itself faster, you know, parallel computing and all things like that, you know, they did start from, you know, from someone doing some research and figure out how things should be done. Um, some mathematics helps to instead of, you know, simulating things now you can explicitly calculate things and stuff like that, right. So I do think I agree that, you know, the, the lines are not very uh, clear and I did have that when I was practicing for my talk, but I do think the arrows go both ways. But thank you for your question. Thank you, Nicoletta. Yeah, very interesting. Um, yeah, I, I also like just from my personal experience, I work with some folks who, you know, are, are their research is around software engineering and best practices around that. So then it is always a field of research for almost everything, which is really fascinating to see. Like if you're interested, this is sort of like a rabbit hole that you can dive right into and see. Um, I yeah. really could rabbit hole, but when you have other research to do as well, you can't dive in too far. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> because my boss wouldn't be too too happy. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So much to so much to learn. So much. Um, fantastic. Well, folks, if you have any further questions, um, you can, uh, yeah, pop pop uh, your questions on our Slack at any time point, and um, we can have a discussion around that, I suppose. But thank you. Um, please have offer a, a round of applause for Nicoletta. All right, uh, well, three minutes uh, over to you, Berenice. Thank you, Amy. Um, and thanks all the speakers for the talk, for their talk. I'm sorry I missed the talk in the middle, but yeah, it seems like it was quite interesting. Thanks a lot, Nicoletta, for your talk. Um, so we are already at the end of the call. Um, any assignments or the catch up with your project was is missing what you need to do. If you need any help, um, do remember that we have a bunch of experts that you can ask for help, for help there. Um, so we have them um, in the in the in the in the website. Uh, I saw an assignment now. Add a citation file if you have not you have not any in your project. So thanks for the person that just had this uh, as an assignment for your project. Um, if you feel stuck or you need any help, please feel free to reach to us to say that invite any in one of us to help you to 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 have a short meetings um, and please complete the midterm survey that has been sent last week. Uh, would be nice. Uh, the next cohort, so next call next week. Um, so next week you have the uh, mentor monthly meetings. Um, we have the Q and A call, so it's a half an hour at six is it i don't remember which time but you see that in the calendar we will send a reminder next week at the beginning of next week so there is no big uh court call it's just a short one if you want to have a, uh, sometimes to discuss and you have specific questions the next court call uh, will be in two weeks and it will be about diversity and inclusion in ally skill um and yeah uh, you can find all the details in the schedule there and if you have a few minutes, we would love to hear about your feedback. So can you feel at the end of the, of the, uh, of the etherpads in line uh, 283, 
what worked, what didn't work, what you changed, what surprised you with this, uh, this course. And on that, I would like to thank all of you. We are just, just in time. And thanks for joining. Thanks for all the speakers and for everybody uh, there. And see you in the next call or anytime online. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.